forward. And I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. All right, guys. Um, so again, just a reminder that the lab schedule is here, right? If you take a look at that, that's where the schedule is in terms of what um, time you're coming, okay? And obviously it's just two sessions with the exception of Thursday has that extra later session, okay? I thought I had, uh, whatever, anyway. Um, yeah, so 2.15 starts the first session. Like I said, if I'm not there at 2.15, just hang out, I'm coming, I'll be there. Um, and then the second session, 3.45. So if you come for the second session, guys, and people are still inside, don't walk into the room, right? Remember, there's a limit in terms of the number of people that can be in the lab at any one time, okay? And I will tell you, I will open all of the windows in the lab, and actually, there's a lot of windows in there, so we'll definitely be able to get a lot of circulation in there, okay? If that makes you guys feel better. Um, and then, like I said, when you come to lab, I'm going to hand you, or, or there's going to be actually two things at the lab station that you're going to sit at, the basically the procedures for what you're doing today, and you're also going to be filling filling it out. So that's kind of the procedures and the assignment at once. And then there's also going to be a lab safety agreement that'll be there. Okay. So you guys are going to read over it and be, and basically sign it. I'll obviously be there to tell you what you need to do. So just so you know, and those of you that are in, in person lab, you're going to hand me those two documents when you're finished. Okay. So I'll, I'll collect hard copies from those of you that are actually in person. Those of you that are going to still choose to be remote, right? Again, you need to log in um, at your designated time through here for the through the virtual lab meetings, okay? So, and then what I'll do is I'll kind of have you, I don't know how I'm gonna do it. Maybe I'll do like a breakout room with like um, you and one of the other people. I don't know, I'll, I'll figure that out how I'm gonna kind of do it, but I may sort of pair you up with somebody so that when they're doing it, you can then be filling out the lab at the same time and kind of doing it with them, okay? So that's the way that I'm gonna to try to make that work. Um, we'll see how it goes. I think it should work out. Um, hopefully the technology cooperates on campus. We shall see. Um, all right, so in terms of, and I think most people handed in this assignment. Now, if you're in Thursday lab, you just need to make sure it's in before Thursday lab time, okay? Um, and remember it's here and know that if you do it in Cami, it's the file is going to be too big to upload here. Just email it to me. Like I said, this is probably the only assignment that this is going to happen. So we'll just leave it as it is. Just email it to me and then I'll still put your grade in the assignment. So you'll see it. Okay. So don't, don't worry about it. Um, I got that now, like I said, for today's lab, right? You, those of you that are coming in person, you don't need to worry about anything. I'm going to give you what you need. You're going to hand it back to me. I then will add your grade to this assignment here, okay? So those of you that are in person, you do not need to submit anything electronically to this assignment. However, those of you who are still remaining virtual, as you're filling out you know, that assignment with your lab partner, um, you are then gonna have to submit this right after you finish the lab electronically, okay? Does that make sense, everyone? So if you click on this, you'll see that the lab safety contract is there and, and also the in-person lab, which I'm going to give you in person. So you guys don't have to worry about printing it out either, okay? Um, if you're coming to lab. If you're not coming to lab, you will electronically complete these and submit them here. Does anyone have a question about that? Okay, so that's what we're doing for lab. Um, now, just like we did this week, moving forward, just because I'm not gonna have you guys, you know, I want to just talk to you guys about this all at once for if you look here there's another lab demo that's up right this is your lab essentially for you know kind of moving into next week this is going to need to be completed before next week's lab again okay then you kind of have a little break the next couple of labs there's there's a little bit of break in the schedule and the next lab is just like labeling organelles it's kind of straightforward okay so we kind of have two bigger labs and then a little break and then we'll come back to some, some sort of larger labs again, okay? So just like you did with this one, except you're not gonna have to, I give you this PDF just for your reference and you're kind of filling that out, but that's not gonna be what you submit. What you submit is this assignment here, okay? 
as long as you listen to my recording, I tell you exactly what you need to do there. All right. So there's no reason for me to go through it right now. That's there. So again, that's due by lab time again next week because we will be doing something in person related to that lab. Okay. Does anyone have a question about that? Uh, which one are we turning in? For, for what? For this week or next week? For the uh, next week lab? For next week, it's this here. See, this is the assignment. This is all the information that you essentially need for this assignment. Okay. This is the recording. So as long as you click that and listen to that first, I'm going to tell you everything that you need to do and what the assignment is. Okay. But you submit it here for next week. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You got it. Thank you. Okay. So same thing. It's by lab time. And then again, I'll do the same thing like I did this week with the in-person. You'll have something that you're filling out when you do it and you'll just hand it back to me right at the end of lab. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions about that? No. Okay. All right, guys. So let's move away from lab. So we should, we kind of have lab all squared away. If there's more questions that kind of come up when you're on campus in person, please ask. Okay. I'll be there and I have time, you know, to answer questions, even if it's about, um, lecture topics or anything you might want me to go over again or something like that. You can ask during lab, right? Like once you guys finish the lab, if you want me to go over something, I'm more than happy to do that. Okay. Again, reminder too, there's the group tutoring sessions Tuesday and Thursday night. So if you, if you're still kind of have questions about stuff, make sure you're asking them there as well. All right, guys. Um, Chapter three, four quiz is scheduled for Thursday. Again, we have to keep up on that material, okay? So um, like I said, let's go over the chapter three homework. I'll also, I have the lecture kind of ready to pull up um, and then I'll move on to chapter four, all right? Um, oh, did I ever show you guys here too? There's animations there. They're just like little short videos about some of the topics in the chapter. So you might want to check those out. Some of them are are helpful. Some people like them, some people don't, but they're, but they're there. Okay. Just wanted to point that out. All right. So let's, let's look at that chapter three homework. Okay. Okay. So the first question says, describe the synthesis and the degradation of one type of biomolecule. So you could choose any biomolecule here, here, right? So why doesn't somebody tell me one that they, they chose? <clears throat> I think, um, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. Oh. oh, I pick lipids. Okay. Pick lipids. You pick, go ahead. Yeah, they break down fat for energy because they have two different types of subunits. That's right. right. That's true. Okay, good. Right. So yeah, lipids are made up of two different types of subunits, right? When we talk about the synthesis. Okay. Um, all right. So then what else did you write for your answer there in terms of kind of describing the synthesis? Actually, that's all I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So what? So let's look at that first, okay? One question. Did you get yes. to grade it? Say it again. Did you get to grade it? I did not. Not yet. Well, no. Because mine shows it, it hasn't. So. Um, all right. So let's get to lipids, right? So that was Vanessa's um, example that she used. So if we're gonna talk, so this is, this is essentially showing you, right? The synthesis and the degradation there, right? So here, right, here's what, um, if, we're, if we're talking about a fat, right? So fat, a type of lipid, right? If we're talking about synthesis, remember what was the general name for the reaction that occurs when you're synthesizing a biomolecule, any of these biomolecules, what do we call it? What's the name for this reaction where water's lost, guys? Dehydration. Thank you, dehydration, right? And so the reason why, you know, this is, this is a little bit different here, fats, when we're talking about kind of biomolecules, it's just that you have three, you have different subunits that are gonna join together to form the fat molecule, okay? Um, so remember what we're talking about here, we're talking about tri triglycerides, okay? Why are these called triglycerides, guys? So another word for fat is a triglyceride, why? 
What do you got? Because they have three fatty acids. And a glycerol. Okay, so that's why that's where we get the name from. And so you basically can describe, you could have described this in words, right? Vanessa, you could say a dehydration. So a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids joined together by a dehydration reaction to form a fat. Okay, that's kind of what I was looking for, I guess. Um, you could also, well, I guess you guys can't because it's electronically, but like if you were doing this by hand, and that's what I usually do, you could also just write this out or draw this out. Um, by the way, I do not expect anyone to know any of these structures or anything like that, okay? That's beyond the scope of, of our class right now, okay? So again, you just want to know that a fat is made up of glycerol and three fatty acids, okay? You don't need to know these structures or anything like that. You don't need to be able to identify, um, you know, a, a fatty acid based on its structure or anything like that, okay? That's, again, beyond the scope. What we're focusing on here is just understanding or talking about how biomolecules are made, right? And so here's an example of a type of lipid, right? A triglyceride or a fat. And this is showing you its synthesis, okay? So now if we go back this way, guys, we're talking about here's our fat molecule, and we go back this way. So Vanessa, say... Say again what you said in terms of when, like when would we be talking about breakdown of a, of a fat? What did you say when you, when you answered the question? I, I, it was, it was good. You still there? Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I said that, uh, lipids break down fat for energy because they have two different types of subunits. Okay. Well, so the cell, right. will break down fats for energy. You're right. And, and when, they, when, when that fat is being broken down, essentially this is the type of reaction that's gonna occur, right? There's a lot more to it, but if for, uh, for us right now, I guess the reason why I wanted you to say that is because it gives you sort of um, perspective in terms of when or why we're talking about this, right? Cells do break down fat for energy, right? Okay, cells also need the ability to synthesize fats. Okay. And so these are two sort of general reactions that, that, that occur. So here, here's your fat molecule. Now, what do we call this reaction guys? Water's being put in here. What's this called? Hydration. Hydration. Rehydration. Rehydration. What's the name of the reaction? Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis. But yeah, so water's being put in, right? And then you're going to, now you're breaking up this fat molecule back to its subunits, right? The one glycerol and the three fatty acids. Okay. Um, all right. So who, so somebody else, what, what mo biomolecule did you choose? Is Throw one out there. Say it. Glucose. I think I'm saying all right. Okay. So a carbohydrate, right? Yeah. Okay. But if we're going to talk about synthesis, right? So if we're talking about carbohydrates, remember really, um, you know, monosaccharides like glucose are sort of the subunits right? So if you're going to talk about synthesis, you would probably talk about synthesis of, or synthesis of a carbohydrate. What you're going to synthesize is a, a more complex carbohydrate, right? Like maltose here. So what do we call maltose? What's the sort of name for a sugar that has two subunits? Two subunits. What do you call it? Yeah, disaccharide. Yeah, disaccharide. Good. So if you in so if you kind of go here, this is what in question one, if you chose a carbohydrate, you would describe something like this, right? Now, do we see based on our other example with the fat molecule, right? Same type of reaction that's occurring. So if you're synthesizing, right, a carbohydrate, it's a dehydration reaction. And if you're breaking it down or, or going through degradation, it's hydrolysis, okay? So this is why I kind of told you guys this when I introduced this, that you're gonna see these same basic types of reactions no matter what type of biomolecule you're talking about, right? But the specifics are gonna be different. So again, nobody has to worry about identifying structures of molecules, okay? We're just showing it this way just so that you can, you can see that, but you don't need to draw a structure or identify a structure that's, that's beyond the scope of, of you know, fundamentals of bio. Okay. So somebody describe, or what would you have written down if you chose this for number one of your homework, seeing it, how would you describe that? 
Who said uh, glucose? You want to describe this? What do you see, what do you see here? How would you describe this in words? I guess that's my question. Um, mm. Go ahead. Well, when I, I was looking at the other uh, picture, but me looking at this one makes me My good. fault. What the hell? Sorry. Okay, but from this, how would you describe this? Um, well, you see CH2 to OH plus, I guess, is uh, being dehydrated, and then the other one with the O in the middle is hydrated. But that's the, but don't think about it that way. You want to think about overall big picture here, right? So you want all all I'm kind of looking for is understanding this overall process. Saying two glucose subunits, right, are going to be joined together. And you're right, where where it's showing this OH and this H, that's where they're going to join together, right? This is that's what this is showing you. So you're right about that. But think about it kind of more bigger picture. So a dehydration reaction is going to basically join together two glucose subunits to form maltose, right? And then a hydrolysis reaction will occur um, when maltose is broken down into two glucose subunits, okay? So one, you're joining the glucose subunits together via a dehydration reaction. This one, you're breaking them, them apart and we call that a hydrolysis reaction because we're adding water in, okay? And basically the water's being added in, why? It's completing, remember we talked about like the valence shells and that, um, you know, an atom is always looking to fill that valence shell. Well, that's why these, the hydrogen's added here and the OH is added there. If that's like throwing you for a loop, don't worry about it, okay? I just want you guys right now to understand that if we're talking about joining two subunits together, and in the case of carbohydrates, we're talking about two glucoses, to form a more complex carbohydrate like maltose, a disaccharide, it's a dehydration reaction, okay? If we're gonna break down maltose to then basically yield two individual glucose subunits, it's a hydrolysis reaction, okay? And you can see down here, right? Two monosaccharides join to form a disaccharide. Does that make sense? Does that help? Do we have questions? Any other questions about that? Okay, if you picked protein as your molecule that you're gonna synthesize, what, how would you describe that? You're gonna say two of something are gonna join together via a dehydration reaction to form what? What would you, how would you state that? Or what would you have put for that? Anyone, what do you think? Sorry, Professor, will you repeat the question? I'm sorry. So say for a protein, right? If, if I'm gonna ask you to describe the synthesis of a protein, what would you say? based on kind of the way I just described this carbohydrate one. Somebody's gotta have an answer. It doesn't have to be right. It's okay if it's wrong. What are the two sub, what are the subunits of proteins? Or the monomers, remember we use that term? Amino acids. Thank you. Amino acids. Okay. So I mean, two amino acids are going to join together or actually not even just two, right? There's never a time where it's only two, but whatever, we're simplifying, right? Two amino acids join together via dehydration reaction. And then essentially that's going to form a polypeptide. Okay. So if I move down to show you that, is proteins our last one or did I skip it? Here we are. Sorry, where's my hair? Okay, there's my example. So this is just showing you a dipeptide, right? Because we're oversimplifying it, oversimplifying it, right? Just showing you two amino acids joining together. Here's your two amino acids, dehydration reaction. They join together with a bond called a peptide bond, and that's gonna form a dipeptide. Now remember, 
with proteins, they're much more complex, right? So you're going to have this happening thousands of times, right, to form an actual functioning protein. What we're just showing you here is when you're joining just two amino acids together, dehydration reaction, right, the peptide bond that forms before, uh, between them. When, it's when you break it down, hydrolysis, right, or degradation, it's going this way. So do you guys see the similarities, I hope, between those three examples that we just went through? Yes? Yes. Thank yep. you. Just not. Question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for um, proteins, mm -hmm. um, proteins is a, is a monomer, right? Correct? What's or, the monomer? Or, a monomer is one. So the monomer are what? Is, are, is, well, because it was, it's known as one, but it has repeating units. So if you look here at this example here, where, what are the monomers? Amino acids. The amino acids. Amino acids. Yeah. yeah. The amino acids are the monomers that join together to form the polymer, which is okay. the dipeptide or the protein is the polymer. Oh, okay. okay? Does that make so sense? I got a little yeah, yeah, I got a little confused. I get it now, yeah. No, that's okay. That's a good question, right? Again, so in any of these, um, so in our example of maltose, right, forming maltose, that disaccharide, what were the monomers in that example? For which one? For the maltose example, the carbohydrate example, what were the monomers? Glucose. glucose. Monocarbohydrates. Glucose, right? Remember, two glucoses joined together to form that disaccharide maltose. So the monomers are glucose or um, right, monosaccharide. So, so the subunits for carbohydrates are mono, are monocarbohydrates. Are monosaccharides. Well, mono, yeah, mono, yep. yeah. You got it. Okay. Other questions, guys? Okay. So, if you then just to kind of, I guess, we might as well finish this off here, right? Um, oh, by the way, since I'm since we're on proteins here. Um, what so this is showing you and i think this is one of the actually the other questions i asked you for the homework i believe um what this is showing you so what we just talked about right was the joining of two monomers right two amino acids those are the beads here on this string joining together right to form a polymer and so this is a really long right large polymer so before before the example just showed you two amino acids a dipeptide this is a polypeptide. Do you guys all agree? Okay. Um, and what, what this is showing you here is the primary structure. So what do we mean by the primary structure? Let me just see what I asked you guys, but I think I asked you the same question. What do we mean by the primary structure? Oh, I didn't ask you this. Um, oh, okay, whatever. For the amino acids, the, uh, the sequence of this uh, amino acids. Very good. That's all the primary structure is. Perfect, right? It's just the sequence of the amino acids. So it's just those amino acids joined together by that the dehydration reaction that we're talking about, right? However, proteins, you know, it's much more complicated than that, right? So, so first this polypeptide chain is made, right? So made up of amino acids. But then what needs to happen to that polypeptide in order for it to be a functioning protein within the cell, right? It has to start folding, right? Or forming these secondary structures. So the secondary structure of a protein basically is composed of these alpha helices and these beta pleated sheets. All it is, is it's a result of like interactions between these amino acids, right? This is showing you like there's hydrogen bonds that form between them, okay? And basically it takes that string, that amino acid string, and it causes it to kind of start folding or organizing into these structures here, okay? Does that make sense? Then when you get to tertiary structure, if you kind of take a look here, you can see that now the shape is more complex, right? So there's more folding that happens, again, as a result of kind of interactions between these amino acids, okay? So I'll ask you this, is the, um, this polypeptide chain, right? 
can that function in the cell and like do a certain job, maybe act as an enzyme or something like that? No, it can't. Okay. Why not? If you think about an enzyme in particular, why not? Because it doesn't have the proper shape to do anything. Yeah. So it's particularly, and we're going to talk about enzymes more, but even, you know, with an enzyme, it has a characteristic shape and it has something called an active site where, you know, whatever molecule or, you know, kind of reaction it's going to act on, that has to then bind to that active site. So if the protein slash enzyme, oh my gosh, you make so much noise. The protein slash enzyme isn't folded properly, you know, what needs to bind there will never be able to bind to it. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of, you know, this is a little bit, um, I guess the concept of the enzyme is moving forward a little bit, but we will talk about that. But again, we want to understand the idea that um, proteins do not function unless they're in their final, you know, folded shape, okay, or conformation, we, we call that. Now, tertiary structure, if, if a protein just has one polypeptide chain, it's final kind of functioning shape will be at this tertiary structure. However, there's something called quaternary structure. These are proteins that are made up of more than one polypeptide chain that then folds and then those folded um, polypeptide chains interact with each other. So like a protein like hemoglobin, one second. Um, Hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin do, guys? I'm not sure of the full definition, but isn't it something with blood? Good. Um, yeah, it's bound to your red blood cells. Go ahead. Isn't it what like produces like your uh, iron or where your iron stores are? So, so iron is is there's a there's an iron group that's part of the hemoglobin molecule. So, so it's involved. Um, it's going to carry oxygen. Correct. I was going to say that it carries oxygen. Carries so. oxygen. Its primary job is to carry oxygen around the blood, right? And primarily, it's on the red blood cells. Um, and yes, there's a heme group or an iron group that's part of it that that's involved in the binding. Okay. Um, so that's why we, you know, you say you have anemia, um, you know, low iron, but also if if your doctor suspected. Um, anemia, they would also measure your hemoglobin levels, right? Or your red, and take a red blood cell count as well, okay? Um, all right, so we want to make sure we understand these different levels of structure of the protein, okay? So I didn't ask you that homework question, so I guess it's good that we're going over it. Um, all right, so I was on my way just to show you guys that, again, the same type of reactions that we've been talking about, okay, happen when we're talking about uh, nucleotides, sorry, nucleic acids as well, okay? Um, let me see what is the best picture. I'll show you guys that. Do I even have that? Huh, maybe we don't have a really good um, thing that shows you that. But regardless, when you're talking about adding um, nucleotides together to form nucleic acids, it's the same idea dehydration reaction and hydrolysis, okay? So you could have really chosen any one of those four types of biomolecules to answer that first question. So are we okay with kind of just understanding in general, right? What, what a dehydration reaction is and when does it occur? If we're talking about synthesis of a biomolecule, right? Like a protein, like a you know carbohydrate, a, a disaccharide or, a, or another polysaccharide, or we're talking about, you know, the synthesis of a fat, okay? Same basic reactions that are gonna occur. Does anyone have questions about that? All right, um, so now the second question, I said name two types of polysaccharides and describe their function. So what did some of you guys put for this? Um, I put starch. It's okay, not, good. Um, it gives energy and like, which is like stored in like the plants. Good. That's the understanding of it. Yep. And it's a storage molecule, a plant energy storage molecule, meaning basically what's starch made up of? Look here. 
What's it made up of? A whole bunch of glucoses, right? So yeah, so that's why we say it's an energy storage molecule um, because basically the plant can then break this down, right? To then get to essentially have glucose that then gets further breaking down, broken down that, they can, that the plant can use for energy. All right, good. What's another example? Um, Go ahead. And like, what about that? What's its function? Um, it stores um, carbohydrates. In, in what, plants or animals? In plants. Which one? Animal. What'd you say? You said glycogen, right? Yes. Store, but it's animals. energy storage in what? Oh, in animals. Animals. Starch is the energy storage molecule in plants, glycogen in animals. Okay. All right, good. What's another, anyone give another example of a, of a polysaccharide, different one? Um, I mean, I chose the structural polysaccharide. Mm -hmm. And under them, um, there was cellulose, which is abundant um, carbohydrate, and chitin, chitin mm -hmm. which has antibacterial and viral properties, and then pep, peptidol, is that pep? Pitoglycan, yeah. Yeah, that, that. Yeah, so good. So these all that are all pictured here, um, that was Moses, right? That Moses mentioned. Um, chitin, right? So shells of some crustaceans are made up of chitin. Um, cell walls of plants contain cellulose. Cell walls of, of bacteria um, contain something called peptidoglycan. So these are all examples of structural types of carbohydrates, okay? All right, good. Or polysaccharides. So I have a question. Yeah. Just to confirm, um, the two types are the energy-based and the structural type, right? Yeah, if you want to kind of break it down into two main types, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. Now, number three says, describe the difference between an unsaturated fat and a saturated fat. So right off the bat, before I show you guys, I gotta go the other way. Um, what's the difference? What'd you write down? Um, unsaturated fats have more than one, well, it has one or more double bonds between carbons, and they tend to be liquid at room temperature. Perfect. Okay, somebody else uh, for saturated fat. Saturated fats, they uh, tend to be solid um, at room temperature. Mm-hmm. Good. Um, and saturated fats don't have any double, double bonds. bonds yeah. Correct. Okay. So it's described here. And then, and so, I, you know, I told you before, you don't really need to know structures, right? But for like this, if I, again, I'm not going to say, you know, what, what type of, you know, fatty acid is this? Like name it. That's no, you don't need to know that. But if you guys look here, if I showed you this picture versus this picture, you should be able to tell me which one's unsaturated and which one is saturated. Does that make sense? So you guys see here, this is the unsaturated fat. It has some double bonds. So these are like plant oils, right? Like olive oil, corn oil, those are liquid at room temperature. And if you notice the structure over here, you can see these double bonds, they create space in the molecule, okay? And so that's why they, they're liquid at room temperature. When you look at something like butter, okay? Oh, yeah, yo, yo. Hello. It went backwards. When you look at something like butter, right, which is a saturated fat, what do you notice about this? And would you be able to identify this as a saturated fat? No double bonds. And then what about this over here? No space. In between. No space, right? Those um, fatty acids are really tightly packed together, okay? And they, these are solids at room temperature. Sort of semi-solid, I guess. Um, for okay, um, Go ahead. For saturated fat, um, the fatty acids are tightly packed, right? Correct. Yep. Yep. So these are the fatty acids. Remember when we talk about a fat, right? It's glycerol and three fatty acids. So yeah, it's the fatty acids that are tightly packed. The double bonds or the lack of double bonds is, is basically, you know, within these fatty acids. You see? Oh, so right. they don't double... Um, wait, so are they doubled? The saturated saturated fat are they doubled in like room temperature or that's not no so for the saturated fats there are no double bonds so if you look up here right so if we say what makes up a fat right it's a glycerol and three fatty acids 
So if you look at the fatty acids that are gonna make up a saturated fat, they don't have any double bonds, right? And they're tightly packed together. Does that answer your question? Yes, because I wrote um, saturated fat, uh, saturated fat like doubles between like the carb. I don't, I think that's wrong. Correct. For saturated fat, there are no double bonds. It's all single bonds. See these here? Single bonds. For the unsaturated fat, there are, there's a double bond or, you know, one or more double bonds, but just the presence of one double bond, it's an unsaturated fat. I think I switched it for like, you know, um, uh, saturated. Okay. So make sure you kind of, you guys get that clear. I do expect you guys to identify, you know, again, if you saw this picture and this picture, you should know which one's the unsaturated fat and which one's the saturated fat. Okay. You also should know which one is liquid at room temperature, which one is solid at room temperature. Any more questions about that guys? All right. Um, I think we already taught, we are, these are easy questions and we already probably answered them. What are the monomers that make up proteins? Amino acids. Thank you. Amino acids, good. What are the monomers that make up nucleic acids? Nucleotides. Nucleotides, good. Um, all right. So any other questions from chapter three? So like I said, on Thursday, beginning of class, we're gonna take a quiz on chapter three and four. It's, it's together. So I'm gonna open up um, the chapter four homework and, and the chapter four lecture to review a little bit. But again, remember the recording is there um, to listen to if you need to listen to it again. Questions for chapter three, guys? Just wanna see if there was anything. Actually, maybe worth going over one other thing here. Oh, so um, steroids. What type of biomolecule are steroids? Lipids. Lipids, thank you. Uh, what about these guys? Why are these important, these type of lipids? Phospholipids. So why do we call these phospholipids? What makes up a phospholipid, right? A polar head, a phosphate group here, and then fatty acid tails. What are these the main components of? Of the cell? Plasma membrane. Thank you, plasma membrane. Correct. The plasma membrane is made up of phospholipids that basically, you know, orient themselves this way in a, in a double layer, right? And we're going to talk more about this um, in next chapter and the chapter after that. But basically, here's your phosphate heads and here are those tails. So it says here, this is polar and this is nonpolar. So which part of the fat, fatty acid is hydrophilic? Which part's hydrophilic? The head. Thank you. The polar head that's made up of this phosphate group and glycerol. What about what part is hydrophobic? Somebody else. The tail. The tails, the two fatty acid tails. And so you can see that these, the two tails face towards the inside of that layer, okay? Um, because they're, they're hydrophobic. So the reason why the membrane forms this way is due to the chemical properties of these phospholipids, okay? So again, we'll talk more about that. Um, so steroids. So if I ask you to give me an example of a steroid, right? Um, you know, think about these are, these are endogenous steroids or steroids that your body produces, right? So there are many hormones that are considered steroids. So estrogen and testosterone, those are steroid hormones, okay? Um, showing you here cholesterol, okay? Cholesterol is a steroid as well. So what about cholesterol? Why, why uh, you know, I think we sometimes think of it in a negative way, but why is cholesterol important to your cells? Um, I'm right, sure. it needs to. Oh. Go ahead, who was that? The blood. Uh, it was, oh. No, go ahead, who, who, who? Uh, no, you could go ahead, Vanessa. Like, Vanessa, go oh, ahead. You can go ahead because I answered a few, you can go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I answered a few, so, yeah. Um, doesn't cholesterol have to do with uh, making hormones? 
So yes, you're right, right? Because that's what I'm showing you right here. But yes, right? So cholesterol is the precursor for making testosterone and estrogen. You don't have cholesterol, your body's not going to be able to make those hormones. So good. Perfect. What's, an, what's something else that cholesterol is important for? It builds the structure of um, cell membranes. Okay. So it is a part of the cell membranes. You're right. And what's its function in the cell membrane? Um, it travels through the blood. But doesn't it help um, digest um, some foods as well? No. Think about in the membrane. So now we're in the, in the cell, in the plasma membrane here, right? Oh. So there's, there's other things that are going to be kind of inserted in here. But cholesterol kind of is kind of spaced out in between these phospholipids here, right? So here's the, here's the cell, right? Here's the outside of the cell. It's part of that cell membrane. Does anyone know kind of what its function is in the, in the cell membrane? I don't know if I even told you guys. It, it just has to do with, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll talk about this more, um, but it helps maintain the fluidity of the cell membrane. So like this, the plasma membrane of the cell has to kind of be um, fluid in that it has to be able to let things in and out, right? And so if it was like super rigid, um, you wouldn't have that, that ability. Also, cells wouldn't really be able to change shape if um, the membrane was too rigid. So Cholesterol is a component, like it says here, of the cell membrane, okay? Um, here, when it says functions, regulation, we're, that, that is basically um, alluding to this, right? That it's involved in producing hormones, okay? Um, one other thing that I added this in, it's not something that the book really covers, but um, I think it's worth noting because obviously we hear about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol a lot. Um, so which one here, HDL versus LDL, which one's the good cholesterol? HDL. HDL. LDL. Oh. HDL is the, is the good cholesterol, right? Um, you want to, if you get your cholesterol levels measured, right, they're going to break it down and they're going to say, here's your HDL level and your LDL level. The HDL level, you want to be higher compared to the LDL, okay? This LDL, and again, what does this stand for, right? Low density lipoprotein. So cholesterol is here. It actually travels around in the blood with kind of um, bound to other lipids and proteins. So that's kind of where this name comes from, all right? So it's not just yeah, cholesterol itself. The LDL okay. is the one that gives you like clogged arteries and yeah. stuff that they have to like, do procedures for? Yeah. So that right, would be like a heart attack or something, right? Or yeah, you? well, correct. If you have high LDL levels, you are at increased risk for developing heart disease, right? Why? Because if you look here, right, this type of cholesterol and basically how it's carried around with these other lipids um, has the tendency to form plaques in, in arteries, right? And so you guys can see this here. Um, so again, if you have a lot of LDL around, it's going to have the tendency of accumulating within the blood vessels. Okay. And so you guys can see that that's gross, right? Um, so not only does the plaque itself basically um, occlude blood from flowing through, but what happens is once the plaque kind of deposits there, those blood vessels become inflamed too. And then it basically causes it to constrict even more. Okay. So overall, just a bad scene. Um, HDL actually go ahead you have a question hey in class can you hear me in class yeah i'm just listening we can hear you <laughs> um so if you guys if you look at this hdl here the hdl actually will help kind of scavenge that bad L, uh cholesterol and bring it back to the liver to basically for it to be metabolized right? So you want HDL around, you really don't want that LDL. So anyway, I thought it was worth noting because we kind of mentioned cholesterol um, and maybe, you know, you kind of heard about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. That's what it's referring to. Okay. Um, all right. Other questions for chapter three, guys. Remember, there's a, there's a couple different types of lipids, right? Waxes is another type. All right, I'm going to minimize this. Again, make sure you review chapter three um, some more, right, for the quiz. 
Uh, let me now, let me go and just pull up the chapter four questions. I think there's only a couple. Yeah, super. Two questions, right? Describe the relationship between the components of the endomembrane system. So I'll just pull up the PowerPoint and just review some of this. Um, describe the function of chloroplasts and mitochondria in plant cells. So in general, what do chloroplasts do? What's the function of a chloroplast? Not just light energy to drive um, cellular machine. Okay, what, what process occurs in the chloroplast? Photosynthesis. Yes, photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Um, good. Uh, so what about mitochondria? Just mitochondria in general. What, what's the function of mitochondria? They have a nickname too. What is ATP? Yeah. It seems like they're similar to the chloroplasts. In structure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, yep. And they're. But aren't they more free? They're like free, more freer? Like they're more spread out, I guess? I don't know. I mean, not the, necessarily. Like the, um. I mean, they have a lot of similarities, right? They both have like a double membrane. Um, they are like energy uh, yielding uh, organelles, I guess, right? Mitochondria. Um, produces there's something that I didn't really understand about it. It says that they were like, um, like they break down, no, not that. Um, they contain res like respiratory Ensemize. So yeah. like they're like a kind of ox oxygen. So correct. If you're if you're are you talking about chloroplasts or mitochondria? Mitochondria. Yeah. So for mitochondria, the process that occurs in the mitochondria mm -hmm. is called cellular respiration, right? Yes. And so cellular respiration, yes, requires oxygen. Okay. Um, and, but what's happening during cellular respiration is basically you're producing ATP. That's how the cell produces energy, but it requires oxygen. Yeah. And we're going to talk, we're going to spend a whole chapter talking about cellular respiration. And what, what they mean by saying like they have their own DNA? They do. There's mitochondrial oh. DNA. They have their own DNA. So meaning, um, there's, there's, so it's actually, um, I think, I feel like it's something that's probably like being studied a lot kind of right now, but they do, they have their own DNA, meaning they themselves can kind of make specific proteins that are um, unique to the mitochondria. Um, and basically the presence of their own DNA kind of uh, um, provides some evidence in terms of their origin, right? Like where they came from, evolutionarily speaking. And I think I talk a little bit about that. If we, let me just say, I don't want to get into it too much, but it's here. But yes, they do have their own DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is passed on to the offspring from the mother too. And there are, there are um, diseases that are due to um, mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. Like I said, it's kind of, um, I don't know, that's a newer, probably a newer kind of field in terms of really looking at that mitochondrial DNA and its role in disease. All right. More questions? We could talk more and more about that, but I don't want to get too far kind of down that, that path, but uh-oh, we're frozen. Ah! What happened? Are you guys all frozen still? Or am I frozen still? No. No. no? Okay. All right. For a second, um, you guys are all frozen. Um, all right. So let's just, let me just take a look at uh, chapter four. I'll review a few things and then we're going to log off um, just so that I can get to campus. So um, the first question asks about, um, so by the way, this endosymbiotic theory, again, it's meant to explain the origin of particularly mitochondria and chloroplasts, right? And so somebody just asked about them, you know, having their own DNA, they do. And that's um, provides sort of evidence of this sort of theory of how they sort of came about, okay? So that's what this outlines. 
I, I don't know, like don't spend a whole bunch of time like going over this. Um, but that's what it's showing you. Basically, you know, I, I want you guys to be aware of it. Um, but basically what it's showing you is that, you know, if we talk about the evolution of like a eukaryotic cell, right? Um, and eukaryotic cells, what about them? They have a whole bunch of membrane bound organelles, right? Including a membrane bound nucleus. Um, and the idea is that there was, you know, a prokaryotic cells were around first, right? And then basically a larger prokaryotic cell was able to engulf like an aerobic bacteria, right? And then that became the mitochondria of that, that what was going to be that eukaryotic cell down the road. And so the same thing here, that larger um, prokaryotic cell engulfed a photosynthetic bacteria, which then became its chloroplast. So what this is meant to explain is how did eukaryotic cells get their organelles, right? It's kind of, it's describing the sort of evolution of that. All right. So like I said, don't go, don't go too nuts with that. That's what that's meant to explain. Ay, why, why? Sorry, I don't know why that just did that. Go away. Oh, did I just like close it? What in the world is going on here? Okay. All right, so the first question on your homework asks about the endomembrane system. Oh, by the way, I'll point this out to you. Um, you know, on your quiz on Thursday, I expect you guys to know the basic function of these organelles. So this slide, and I'm sure I say this in the recording, is like super, the words are super small, okay? So it's probably hard for you to read it right now, but on your own computer, you can open it up and zoom in. It's kind of nice because it shows you where the, the organelles are located and gives you just that basic function, okay? So like for studying for the quiz, study this, okay? Um, you should know the basic function of these major organelles, okay? Um, again, that first question asks you about the, um, endomembrane system, okay? And so it's really just a way of sort of um, categorizing some of these organelles. And so it consists of these things here. So the nuclear envelope, what's the nuclear envelope? What's that? I mean, it's essentially, it's the, you know, it's the nuclear membrane right? But it, it's really a, it's, it's two membranes and then there's also pores that are in, in there. Okay. Um, so you can kind of see that, that here. All right. And we go through it a little bit more. I'll show you that. I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, endomembrane system. If you kind of continue from there, endoplas membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. So what happens in the ER? What's the function of it? This is giving you function here. So again, we should know basic function. So if I ask you, so you have rough ER versus smooth ER. Let me ask you this, what's the difference? What's, why do we call the rough ER the rough ER? The rough ER has um, ribosomes on it. Correct. And they um, both synthesize things. The rough ER synthesizes proteins, the smooth ER synthesizes lipids. Correct. Right? Correct. So the rough ER synthesizes proteins. Really though, the protein synthesis is occurring on what organelle? The ribosomes, right? So we call it rough ER because it's studied with ribosomes. The protein synthesis is actually happening on the ribosome, but then basically that protein is kind of ends up entering into the ER. Okay. Um, so yeah, we kind of say for function of rough ER, you may say protein synthesis, but if, it, but really remember, it's really the ribosome that protein synthesis is occurring. Okay. Um, in the rough ER, after that protein is synthesized on the, on the ribosome, you then get modification and processing of those proteins. And yes, you're correct. The smooth ER synthesis of lipids. Okay. So kind of, we should know those functions. Um, yeah. So if you look here, that's what this is showing you. So here's your nucleus, right? You have the nuclear envelope, and then this is showing you the rough ER and the smooth ER. They're all continuous with each other. So that's why we kind of, we, we kind of lump them together as part of this system. Okay. Um, if you move further on, you have the Golgi. So what's, if I ask you just to kind of in like five words, tell me the function of the Golgi, what would it be? Ooh, I just gave you guys. Um, the Golgi identifies proteins. So it, it mm. modifies proteins and lipids. 
but so that would work as a function but also what else does it kind of do it, it say that again what did you say it what proteins oh they ident identify yeah proteins? so that's true it does it identifies them and then what does it do it sort of sorts them right yeah sorts them inside the uh thing yeah yeah and sort of packages it basically them tells them what to do yeah yep where exactly. to go. You got it. It tells them where to go. So you can kind of, if you want to think of like an easy kind of just basic quick function of the Golgi, um, we kind of say it's the sorting and packaging center of the cell. So right, it'll identify the proteins, right? And it does that by kind of modifying them in some way. And then we'll sort them and say, all right, you're supposed to go here. You're supposed to go here. So it, it essentially directs them as to where they're going to function in the cell. So that's good. That's a good description. Um, right, and so that th this is now showing you the Golgi, okay, and what it's showing you inside here are some proteins, right, entering into the Golgi, and then what about these proteins here, where are they ultimately going? Where's their final, I guess, destination here, what is it, where's it showing? To the vessel? Well, what's this here, do you think? Secretion. Meaning what? Secretory vesicles. Correct, and, it, and it's being sent out of the cell, right? So you can just think of like um, a cell that's gonna produce, say a certain you know, peptide hormone or something like that. It would produce it and then ultimately would, it would end up being released and then if it's a hormone, getting into the bloodstream, right? So there are a lot of proteins um, you know, that, and even we talked about like steroid hormones, right? Those are lipid type of lipids that would then need to be released from the cell. Okay, but then there's also going to be a lot of proteins that are going to be are going to need to function within the cell. Okay, so the Golgi is going to decide where they're going to go. Okay, based on what their function is. Um, all right, so lysosomes, we kind of consider them as part of that endomembrane system as well. Everything in the endomembrane system is basically made up of membrane, right? It's so here we're saying lysosomes are membrane bound vesicles, but they have something inside, right? They have enzymes inside, digestive enzymes. So if you're going to say a function for lysosome, what would you, what, what would you write down for a function of a lysosome? I mean, you can say the digestive system of the cell, okay? So large molecules um, would kind of enter into the cell and then end up entering into the lysosome and they'll be broken down there, okay? So there are things that your cell doesn't necessarily want, right, or needs to get rid of. So that's why we kind of call it the digestive system of the cell. So that's why it says it stores the diseases? Say it again? So that's why it says it stores the diseases? Well, there are lysosomal storage diseases, um, and the reason why it, it names it like that is, yeah, instead of, um, so these large molecules, right, entering into the lysosome, instead of them being broken down, they're missing an enzyme. And so the cell's not able to break them down. And then all of that ends up sort of accumulating in the lysosome, right? And so that's why it's say, calling it a storage. And then it ends up killing the, the cells can end up dying because of it. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what this means. So this is an example of one, right? So it's an, it's missing. So in Thai sacs, it's missing an enzyme that digests the fatty substance, um, which obviously must have, it's, 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 it's a component of, of myelin. And when, and there's times when the cell needs to break that down. And so what happens is if it can't, it accumulates inside there and gets stored inside those lysosomes. And eventually it causes the cell to dysfunction and die. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right. So that, that's kind of just a summary of the endomembrane system. I obviously quickly went through it. Um, in the recording, I go through it in, in a lot more detail. This picture is nice because it kind of summarizes everything I just went through and shows you all of those components, sort of how they work together. Okay. So again, for the quiz, you know, for chapter four, I expect that you know the function of the organelles. A lot of the questions I think I ask you kind of from chapter four on the quiz are like, you know, what's, you, you sh it's multiple choice, just like the other quiz, but, um, you know, knowing the function of the ribosome, function of the mitochondria, okay? 
um, the function of all these organelles. So like I said, um, if you're going to start off or somewhere to study from, that initial diagram where it shows you here, where it shows you all of the organelles and the function, make sure you, you know that, okay? Um, you also should know kind of what the components of the endomembrane system are. We just went through those, okay? Um, no, you know, again, chloroplasts, any, all of the, of the um, organelles that are shown in that initial slide um, that I then go through in much, in much more detail later on, okay? But you just want to know basic function for the quiz, okay? Just quick basic function. Ribosome, protein synthesis, right? Golgi, the sorting and packaging system of the cell. Smooth ER, synthesizes lipids, okay? All right, guys, any, any other questions? All right. The test is online? You're going like to be one. You're going to be taking the quiz. Correct. Everything's on Moodle. You're going to be taking the quiz on Moodle at the beginning of class on Thursday. So once everyone logs in, everyone's going to take that quiz. Okay. Um, I have a question. Are we meeting? Yeah. Are we meeting in person on Thursday? Yes. The plan is to meet in person. Thank you for asking that. Actually, I meant to remind you guys that um, the plan is to meet in person on Thursday. So those of you who um, are in person, just make sure you have your computer with you to take the quiz. I still will let you use your notes or whatever, um, you know, during the quiz, okay? So just plan on being in class, you know, on time to get ready. I'll try to get there a few minutes early so that I, we don't have all the technical issues, but while you guys are taking the quiz, I probably can resolve most of those things, okay? So um, everyone, whether you're in person or via Zoom, you're gonna log on to Moodle at the beginning of class and you're gonna take that quiz. All right, guys? The quiz is next Thursday, correct? It's this Thursday. This Thursday. Yeah, this Thursday in two days. Um, and then I also kind of gave you a heads up too at the beginning of class, like your exam is scheduled for Tuesday, next week, a week from today, okay? If we feel like we might need an extra day and, and push it back to Thursday, I'm okay with that, but it's not gonna be pushed back any further than that, right? Um, we've been just covering a chapter a week, which is really, um, we're not really moving any faster at all than I normally would, okay? So again, if there's questions, we need, you know, we'll make sure we review. Um, and if we feel like we need an extra day, I may give you guys an extra day, but the exam is definitely next week, okay? And it's gonna be on Moodle. All right, guys, um, I'll stay on for a few minutes if anyone has questions, but you guys are free to log off. Um, and then I will be logging off shortly though, because I gotta drive. Thank um, you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.